Okay, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, this is our uh, seventh session of, of our iSchool Insights uh, virtual webinar series. Uh, this is a series we've been hosting uh, throughout this summer and will continue in the fall as well. Um, that is really featuring um, lectures, presentations, and other opportunities for engagement with our iSchool faculty, our leadership, alumni, and some of our current students as well. Um, so again, over the past couple of weeks in the summer, uh, we've covered uh, many of the trending topics that are in the information field um, and really just trying to give uh, you an opportunity to learn directly from and engage with our, our iSchool faculty experts um, and, and our students are both current and former students who are really actively engaged in the information field. So please, uh, please stay tuned for our, our uh, information about our next sessions. Um, that, that'll be coming in uh, both in uh, your emails as well as on our, our website as well. Um, I'll lay a couple kind of ground rules before we get started. Uh, we are recording this session, so it's going to be made available on the, uh, on the webpage. Um, so just so you know, I, I am recording right now. Um, in terms of an agenda, uh, we'll uh, kick it off to Professor Dedrick. He'll do uh, his presentation, um, and then we'll use whatever time that is remaining to do a question and answer uh, session um, with Professor Dedrick. Um, I'll go over the questions procedures when we're uh, at that point, uh, but basically we'll be able to either raise your hand um, or indicate in the chat function um, that you'd like to ask a question. And then I can make sure that your microphone is unmuted and you can ask that question audibly. Um, or if it's easier, you can always just write your questions in the chat box um, and I will uh, read the questions aloud for Professor Dedrick. Um, so before I kick it off to Professor Dedrick, I'll give him a, a Quick introduction. Um, Jason Dedrick is a, a professor at the School of Information Studies, the iSchool um, at Syracuse University, a uh, faculty fellow at the Syracuse Center of Excellence. Um, he's also affiliated with, I believe, the director of the university's Smart Grid Research Center. Uh, he has a wide a ranging um, kind of set of research interests, uh, which include uh, the globalization of information technology, uh, the economic and organizational impacts of information technologies, uh, the offshoring of knowledge work, global value chains wind energy industries and the adoption of smart grid technologies by electric utility companies, as well as the related privacy issues related to smart meters. Um, Professor Dedrick's presentation today is going to focus on, I believe the kind of the latter half of those research interests that I just described. Um, and it is titled the smart grid technologies, uh, transforming the electric grid with advanced information systems. So without any further ado from me, I'll kick it off to uh, Professor Jason Dedrick. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to the uh, San Diego campus of the iSchool, which is where I am right now. Uh, it's nice and bright, and bright and early here, so I've got a lot of energy and ready to talk to you about my research. Um, let me say hi to everyone. Uh, Abjit, Abu, Anjuman, Ben, Brendan, Dia, Jessica, John. Kamal, Mingxuan, Mike, Peter, Uchita, Sandro, Shripad, a friend of mine, actually works for me, and uh, Trishla and Yuzhou. Did I miss anyone? Cool. I'm glad, I'm glad to have you here. Um, so, as I said, I'm here in the cross country from, from our, our main office and main campus. Um, doing my teaching and service and everything uh, online and virtually, but let's face it, we're all virtual now these days, aren't we? Uh, or transitioning from virtual back to a kind of semi-virtual, semi-course um, uh, situation on campus. Maybe later we'll talk a little bit about what you guys are doing and, and what, what your expectations are. Um, of this fall quarter and, um, you know, just, just open it up a little bit later. But to start with, I want to talk with, um, talk with you about some research we're doing on smart grid. And just to frame this a little bit, you know, here we are in the year of the pandemic and we just heard yesterday that Google's workers are going to be working from home as long as next July. So almost another year, um, that's the plan, is to be working virtually. Um, a lot of us are working virtually, you have all these great tools like Zoom and Microsoft Teams that we've come to, to know and sometimes love. And um, one thing that they all have in common 
is that none of them would work without one thing. Anyone want to guess what that one thing is? You can win a point for raising your hand and guessing. Unfortunately, there's no class here, so I don't have any place to put that point. Uh, what is the thing we can't live without? Brendan. Make sure people can hear me I'm calling on you. I've got plenty of answers in the chat here, Professor Dedrick. Oh, okay. That's what I need to be looking on. Everybody's chatting. Uh, now I've got to find the chat. Okay, so I don't see a chat. Give me a couple examples of the answers, Mike. We have, uh, yeah, sure, sure, certainly many answers uh, ranging uh, internet, electricity, power, people, technology. Uh, that kind of runs the gamut there. All right, two of you got to what I was looking for power or electricity. Okay, all of this mind bending technology that we have at our fingertips works only as long as there's electricity. Um, unless we come up with something else for these computers to run on. In fact, it's not just our computers, it's not just what we're working with, but pretty much everything in our life would stop without electricity. Pull the plug on the power and you have nothing. You'll have food for a very short time. You won't have transportation for very long. You won't have a place to live with heat or light. Um, you won't have a job. Civilization as we know it would pretty much cease to exist if we had a few weeks without electricity. So it's an important point <laughs> if we want to keep our civilization going, that we need to keep the electric grid safe and reliable and dependable as it as we've become used to in our lives uh, forgive me here I'm trying to see the chat Okay, just skip the chat. When someone chats, um, just give me a holler. All right, jumping ahead. Life with no power. If I can get this slide to come up. Okay, this is what life with no power looks like in the largest and most powerful city in the United States, which is New York City. In uh, 2012, there was a hurricane called Superstorm Sandy, which did a tremendous amount of damage. As you can see, lower Manhattan is dark, except for one building there, it looks like it has a generator that might be running. The subways were flooded, the power lines, underground power lines were flooded. Everything was out. Manhattan was not prepared for this kind of disaster and it and its surrounding areas really were not prepared for the damage to the electric line. So what happened? There were tremendous power outages, right? New York City itself, um, over 800,000 New Yorkers lost their power for over 10 days. Out on Long Island, um, to the east of the city, over 630,000 Long Islanders were left dark uh, for two weeks, 
So you can imagine how life is, is getting along after two weeks without power. Um, New Jersey's biggest utility public service and enterprise group had severely damaged infrastructure and 1.7 million outages. So you can see in the case of just one major storm, how the utility grid in the major metropolitan area can be knocked out and knocked out for a long time. Okay. Another example is what happened in Puerto Rico in 2017 and 2019. Okay, in 2017, Hurricane Maria arrived and did tremendous damage to the electric grid. It took 11 full months to restore power. So there were people going month after month after month with no electricity. Some of them may have had diesel generators, but a lot of them had no access to power. Then, just as they were getting the grid rebuilt, there, was, there were two earthquakes in 2019 and 2020. And again, two thirds of the utilities customers remained out without power for days. So, what are some of the things we can do about that? Somebody raised their hand? Oh, someone entered the waiting room. Gotcha. Okay, I'm gonna give you a contrast now. In another major storm, Hurricane Harvey hit the southeast coast of Texas around Houston, 50 inches of rain. Now, I don't know if you've ever lived through 50 inches of rain. I haven't. That is an enormous amount of rain that come down in a couple of days. The storm just hit and sat there and just drenched that area. It caused widespread devastation in Houston and the surrounding areas. Nearly a mil million customers of the utility center point energy lost electricity. As power lines were down and substations flooded. You can see the area that the hurricane hit which is, you know, Texas is a big state, so this is a very large area, and, and the reddest color is where they had the heaviest rain, up to 50 inches. This picture on the right kind of looks like a piece of abstract art, but what it really is, is an electric substation underwater. So you see the reflection of some of the transformers, things that are above water reflecting in the water. Um, unfortunately, Electrical equipment doesn't really run very well when it's underwater. So that's a bit of a problem they're facing. Okay, and yet, in this case, they didn't take 11 months to get the power back, or they didn't take two weeks to get the power back, or three weeks, as some of the other cases we looked at. But instead, Service was restored to over 580,000 customers within just four days and was maintained for most customers while the rest of the repairs were made. Okay, so power was back in a matter of days rather than weeks or months. Um, you can imagine the people of Houston appreciated that and you can imagine that the amount of economic damage was much um, less in that case than it was in New York or Puerto Rico. So how do they do this? Well, this is going to lead to the topic of, of, of mostly of what I want to talk about today, which is smart grid technologies. So when Hurricane, um, Hurricane, what, what was the name of that hurricane, Hannah? Harvey, I think it was an H. When Hurricane Harvey hit, it was about 10 years after another big hurricane hit called Hurricane Ike. And Hurricane Ike did a lot of damage. And so the utility decided to make a lot of investments in smart grid technologies to make the grid smarter and to make it more resistant and more resilient. And you can see the results with how fast they were able to respond to this major storm. 
So when you think about the US electric grid, we have a large number of challenges facing the grid right now. The US electric grid is over 100 years old. To a large extent, it doesn't look that much different than it did 100 years ago. Our grandparents, um, if they were around and happened to see the, the grid, in those days, we'd come back today and look at the grid and say, hmm, it's pretty much the same. Uh, same kind of layout, same structures, functioning the same as it ever has been. Um, but its effectiveness is, is declining and it's facing several challenges that require the transformation of the grid for it to still be effective and viable. The first big challenge is the reliability and resilience of the grid. So the US electric grid lost more power and 285% more power in 2015 than it did 30 years ago, earlier in 1984. Uh, so the record of reliability and resilience has gotten worse over the years. And these extreme weather events like Harvey and like um, Maria and Sandy are becoming more and more frequent as we have more climate change, more global warming, and um, we see expansion of water, we see um, warmer water that drives more powerful storms. So all of these events uh, are starting to become more and more common and are a serious threat to the continued reliability of the grid. Second challenge, is sustainability. Uh, this is the challenge to the environment caused by the electric grid. Right now, about 25% of all carbon emissions in the US come from electricity generation. So if you think about it, carbon emissions come from a lot of things. They come from cars running, they come from buildings, they come from all kinds of manufacturing activity, um, they even come from volcanoes and, and various other sources. And out of those, fully 25% just come from generate, generating electricity, and mainly because generation is done with fossil fuels. Okay, coal and natural gas are the main sources of power in the US. Okay, in order to reduce those carbon emissions, we need to increase the supply of renewable energy sources. Um, we do have renewable sources, whether it's hydropower or whether it's solar power or wind power, geothermal power, um, even nuclear power, they are zero emission or low emission sources. And so shifting the grid to those sources can make the grid and, and our society more, more um, sustainable by reducing the power of the, uh, the emissions associated with the grid. Uh, but as we'll talk about, those renewable energy sources, especially sun, solar power, and wind are variable, meaning they don't run at the same amount all day long. You know, the sun goes down at night, or if it goes behind a cloud, or if a wind turbine stops running because there's no wind, now you don't have power. <laughs> so that's a problem, right? So if, we, if we're going to switch to renewables, we're gonna to have to deal with times when there's no power and we have to make adjustments to that. And as we talk about the smart, the smart grid, can actually place a role, play a role in responding to that. To get an idea of what the sustainability challenge is, this, just, this slide just shows the carbon immensity, intensity of, of carbon emissions in the electric sector and the building sector. Okay, so the electric grid, which is there in, in green, has come down from about 2,500 million metric tons in the US and put in 2005 
to a little over 1,500 by 2018. So it's actually down by 26%, uh, which is good progress. A lot of that's come from um, replacing coal with natural gas to some extent, but also by introducing more renewables uh, to replace both of those. And the power to the buildings and carbon emissions from building hasn't changed much. So some progress is being made, but there's a long way to go to get to net zero, which is the, the goal of a lot of companies now, a lot of utilities and other companies is to have a net zero carbon footprint. So some ways that we can get there are to continue to use less electric power for our existing uses, but also to shift uses such as buildings and automobiles to electricity. So an electric car or an all electric building can be supplied by electricity, which can be all or mostly renewable. So you imagine you buy your electric vehicle and you've got solar panels on your roof and you always charge your, your car when it's a nice sunny day and you're never using any fossil fuels to charge that car. And the car itself doesn't have gasoline, doesn't have diesel, it's running entirely on electricity. And if that electricity is, is generated by non-carbon non sources, then your driving can be zero carbon. The same with your buildings. They're using energy uh, in the form of natural gas a lot of times to heat and cool your house. And if you swap out electricity for natural gas, you can also greatly reduce the uh, carbon impacts of buildings. Okay, any questions? Comments? I think I've lost my. Uh... I don't know where you all are. Yeah, feel free to jump in. And if you can just holler or you can raise your hand if you have any thoughts. Change the settings so everyone can un unmute themselves whenever they'd like. So if you do have a question, feel free to jump in or use the chat box and I'll, I'll read it aloud to Professor Dedrick. Yeah, I don't, and, and I'm encouraging you to talk. <laughs> It's a, you know, if you're going to be in our school, you're going to have to talk. Uh, we're not a very, we don't have a, a passive approach to learning. Good. You show you got Huang. Yeah, yeah. I just wonder, Professor, can you talk a little bit more about the buildings? Like, like it's like, what's the difference between buildings and uh, like uh, compared with the electric power? Like, I, I can understand electric power, but I don't know what the buildings means. So a building has to do a few things. They need to be heated. If the weather's cold, they need to be um, cooled. If the weather's hot, they have, most buildings have water, which needs to be heated um, for, you know, if it's just for general use or if there's some kind of process going on that needs hot water. Um, so the building, most buildings are using natural gas for a number of those purposes. The stove, a lot of, you know, my house has an electrical or a natural gas stove. We have a water heater that uses natural gas. Um, don't know what else we use, but a couple major appliances. And so these appliances are burning natural gas all the time. And that natural gas, as it's burned, is being released into the atmosphere. It has a lot of methane, which is more or less what natural gas is, and that's a, that's a greenhouse gas. It's not as long lasting a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide, but it's actually a more powerful greenhouse gas. So methane tends to get released when you burn it, but it also tends to get lost as it's generated, 
and it's a, as it goes through the pipes to come to your house, there's leakage. Um, and so because of that, using natural gas in, the, in a building is actually a significant contributor to global warming, to climate change. So if you could make that shift of those appliances from natural gas over to electricity and then supply the electricity with clean energy, with renewable energy, you're gonna have an effect on both the electric power grid and on the buildings, which are two major sources. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay. And I don't have it in the picture here, but automobiles are a tremendous, and cars, trucks, everything even ships and, and boats are tremendous generators of um, greenhouse gas. And one way to reduce that is to, as I said, charge the vehicle, you know, get an electric vehicle instead of a internal combustion engine vehicle and charge that vehicle when the sun is shining with your with your own um, solar panels, right? So you can imagine taking the emissions associated with electric power, the, the emissions associated with buildings and the emissions associated with travel, with automobiles and other, other vehicles um, being greatly reduced if we make the move to electricity and then provide the electricity with clean energy. Now, this sounds easy enough. Natural gas is, um, I mean, solar and wind are now the two cheapest support supplies of, of electricity in the world. Uh, used to be natural gas was cheaper, but now coal is completely non-competitive and natural gas is kind of even with, with solar and, and wind in a lot of places. Uh, and in some places, solar or wind is the cheapest source. So the cheap energy is there. The electric cars are there. The ability to, to make that shift to electricity is there. Um, but there are some challenges. And one challenge, speaking of California, is the California duck curve. Now, you might be able to see this um, slide, and if you have a good imagination, you can kind of picture the duck. Uh, if I can mark this along here, but here's the tail of the duck, and then this goes down to the belly of the duck, and then this comes up to the head. Is that clear? So the reason it's called a duck curve is this is the total electric load in California year after year, starting with 2012 and then going down to 2020. And what happens, this load represents the amount of power that California needs to draw from the grid. And in the early part of the day from midnight to about 6 p.m., 6 a.m., it's flat. There's no solar power. And so, and people are just kind of getting up or sleeping and they're not doing much. Um, so not much changes. But about 9 a.m. the sun comes out. And what happens then is as you get more and more sun, which are not on this picture, the amount of power needed from the grid gets lower. So you get this low belly of the curve because people don't need to draw so much electricity from the grid because they've got their own solar that's providing it. Or if you look at it at the wholesale level, the way California is looking at it, they're looking at all of the solar on the grid, which is people's houses, but also these giant solar farms that are scattered all over the state in California. So in midday, the system operator who has to make sure the power stays on is actually can go into a negative situation where they're paying people to take solar power, you know, just to get rid of it. And then later in the day, the sun starts to go down. And by about six o'clock, people are coming home from work. They're 
starting to cook and they're starting to use their TVs and, and their devices and using you know the air conditioning if it's summer and you see this steep steep curve going up to that head of the of the duck and what that requires they have to meet that demand every second and so the way they do it is they have these power plants usually natural gas that they call peaker plants and it's, they're called that because they provide power at peak demand so what the utility does when they go from that bottom down here up to the top is they have a bunch of natural gas plants sitting and waiting to come on. They're called spinning reserves because they're actually like the turbines are spinning and they're ready to provide power as needed. And they may need to provide it in a matter of seconds to keep the power going and to keep the power quality so your lights aren't all flickering and going crazy. And so they do this kind of highly choreographed adding of, of capacity from that low part of the belly, belly all the way up to the head of the duck. Um, it's risky. If something doesn't work just right, you can lose power altogether. It's very expensive. These power plants that are just sitting around waiting most of the year are very expensive because they cost a lot of money and they have to re recap that money in a few hours a year. So every day you're going through this very expensive and risky process with the California duck coop. So is that visible to everybody? Any questions? You see the, you see the duck in there? <laughs> We're gonna see another duck in a little bit later. Um, ducks are an important part of electricity as we'll find. Okay, so what's the solution to all these problems? We've got these issues of resilience, failing systems, um, the demand to bring on more renewables, that challenge of the intermittency or the variable nature of, re of renewables. The wind's not always shining, the sun's not always blowing or vice versa. Um, one solution is the smart grid. Okay, and what's a smart grid? Smart grid applies digital technologies to make the grid more reliable, resilient, and clean. Um, so to try to solve those three challenges that we've just talked about, reliability, resilience, and um, cleanliness, uh, emissions. And smart grid is actually a very complex system, but some of the key elements are smart meters, um, we talk about AMI, advanced metering infrastructure, which are these smart meters that sit on a house and communicate two ways. They receive information from the grid and they send information from the grid, from the house to the grid. Okay, so that gives a two-way communication and real-time monitoring with customers. Um, there's also monitoring and control technologies. You Probably have heard of the IoT, the Internet of Things. Well, the smart grid is one big Internet of Things. It has monitors and sensors and controllers all over it. So they can see if the frequency is getting out of a phase on a certain part of the grid. They can see if part of the grid is being overloaded, if there's, if there's too much load and it may go down. They can see if um, a big transformer is about to blow um, and, and bring down the grid. All of this monitoring has been put on in recent years to watch, monitor the performance of the grid and send that information back to analyze. Now, where do they send that data back? Yeah, just like. Yeah, to ML. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just wondering how would smart grids help in situations like hurricane, the beginning slides that you showed? How would smart grids help in such a situation? Like, I, I can't connect with uh, how would it even be helpful? 
how would it connect with the, the duct curve or with the resilience? With the resilience, because um, if there is a hurricane, these grids are also going to get uh, flooded and submerged in it. So end of the day, the consumer might not still get the power despite me being on a smart grid, correct? I mean, I can't connect on how this can avoid a problem like a hurricane. Okay, so this is what happened in, in Houston and has happened in other places. If the grid is smart, it lets you know immediately if a power line is down. So what happens a lot of times in a hurricane is the wind will knock down power poles and power lines will come down and people will lose their power. Now, in the old days, the only way to find out that the power was out is if somebody called on the telephone and said, hey, my power is out. And that's kind of hit and miss. You have to figure out where they are. Um, you, you don't really have any more information that somebody's power is out. And then they would send a truck to go drive around that area and see if they could find out where the problem was. So this is pretty slow and inefficient. With smart meters and IoT, if the power goes out on 100 houses, the smart meter sends a message. They call it the last gasp message, like, I'm dying. And it goes back to the data center where the utility is operating and the utility can see exactly which houses are up. It can also see if some of the power lines are down, maybe on the streets or something, because those have monitors on them too. So they're sitting in a command center effectively, and they're looking at where there are power outages. And they can look at how those relate to the location of different substations and different elements of the grid and say, aha, this is where the problem is. And they tell their repair crews to take the truck to the exact spot where the problem is. And they can turn off the power and fix it and get the power back on very quickly. They don't have to be driving around trying to find where the problem was. It's all visualized to them. Um, the, the, the crews will be carrying something like a tablet, which will be connected to the utility and they'll get you know, a message, go three blocks down you know, Smith Street and there's um, where your problem is. So the efficiency of, of knowing where problems are and being able to see new problems in real time enables them to restore power much more quickly, you know, to do it in four hours instead of four days. Also with the two-way communications, they can let people know um, they send messages to people and say, hey, we know your power is out. Uh, our crews are working on it, and we expect to have power back in four hours. And so the people, uh, you know, b before this, if your power went out, you just sat there in the dark and wondered if, when it was going to come back on with no idea. Now you get a message on your phone that says, yeah, you, you should have your power back in four hours. And then you can say to yourself, Oh, good. You know, my food will be okay for four hours. You know, if they say it's going to be 48 hours, then my food's going to spoil, you know, because I don't have a refrigerator. So you have a lot more information to know, like, how you're going to survive this. And it makes the whole repair and restoration of the grid much faster and much more, much more efficient. Okay. Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, it also helps with the duct grid, but I'm going to get to that when I, when I get to some data that we have to talk about a little bit. So the, uh, the smart grid has a number of elements. There's actually meters on houses that send back information like this little city network up on the right hand corner is houses and they send meters, but there's also the distribution grid, the transmission grid and the big power plants on the left. Um, you have a network connecting all of those. All those little lines are basically communications network going back and forth from one part of the grid to the other. And on the bottom, you have a bunch of different software systems that perform 
different functions on the grid. Okay, you have transmission management, you have um, DMS, which is um, demand service, OMS is outage management, asset management. All of these are, you can think of as software and systems that are the brains of the smart grid. Basically, they take all that information coming from the IoT and from the outside and turn it into useful information. If you look at smart grid as a technology stack, which is a kind of a typical way we look at things, you can see there's a power layer, which is actual physical power in devices, a communication layer, which is like smart meters and, and, and two-way networks they use. And then there's a software and data analytics layer, which is the brains of this whole thing. Um, software for customer service, for price and usage and billing and, and mobile apps and so on. AMI is the smart meters for meter reading, connect, disconnect, meter data management. And what I'm calling broadly the Internet of Things, which is um, these devices that monitor the grid assets can provide predictive maintenance um, to tell you that, oh, this transformer is probably going to go down in the next six months because the, the, the oil is getting bad. And also do demand forecasting and demand response. So smart grid adoption by utilities has been limited. Um, there was a big grant from the Department of Energy in the early 2010s and quite a bit of investment went in. And yet since that time, the adoption by utilities has lagged and it remains highly uneven. Some utilities have 100% smart grid meters and some have none at all, somewhere in between. So we're asking ourselves when we did this research, why is that? If this thing is so valuable and so obvious to everyone, why isn't everyone adopting it? Okay. Um, this is not really necessary, but it's a, a quick picture of the utility industry in transition from locally regulated monopolies in the 1980s, where one company would own the generation, transmission, distribution, and retail to today where you have some integrated, but you also have these other kinds of models where you have independent generators that run their own power plants. And they sell to the ISOs, which are state level um, system operators. And then you have companies that provide T&D, which is transmission and distribution, and then you have retailers. So it's a much more complex market system now than it was uh, 20, 30 years ago. So we did a research project where we looked at smart grid adoption and tried to figure out why we were seeing this pattern that we were. We did a series of interviews, a survey, and um, some focus groups to collect information on the grid and, and what was happening there. Um, our conceptual model was something called the TOE, which is the Technology Organization and Environment Model. Uh, and the point there is that technological decision-making like adopting the smart grid is driven by factors related to the technology itself, to the nature of the organization and to the environment in which it's happening. So a few, a few things we found out from our interviews and our surveys. Um, technology factors were important. Utilities had to see perceived benefits had to perceive some benefits and the main ones that they saw were cost avoidance and increased reliability. Um, and they also saw perceived risks that the technology was still immature, it was still pretty new and that it was expensive. So there were pros and cons with the technology. Um, organizational factors that made a difference, top-down management. If top management favored smart grid adoption, that tended to drive down through the organization and tend to lead to greater adoption rates. Um, from the bottom up and throughout the organization, a strong innovation culture leads to greater adoption. Um, innovation culture is one of those things you can measure and you can see it. It's hard to know where it came from. You know, why is, why is one organization more innovative than others is a good question, but 
we found when that kind of culture was there that there was higher levels of adoption. Um, and finally, the ownership, there's three different types of utilities, these big investor-owned utilities with a lot of financial and human resources. Um, we found they were more likely to adopt smart grid technologies than their um, counterparts, the municipally owned and the cooperative owned, which um, serve smaller areas across the country. Um, there's actually 3,000 electric utilities in the U.S. Um, and they come from all sizes and shapes of ownership. Environmental factors, consumer attitudes were a factor because it was not always clear to the consumer what the benefits were of these technologies. Uh, and they had concerns about privacy and safety and also the regulatory environment as all of the smart grid projects have to be approved by their local regulator. Um, and the evaluation criteria tends to favor low risk. You know, the criteria, criteria is, was it a prudent investment and is it used and is it useful? And when you're talking about things like software and technology, it's pretty hard to know ahead of time if it's really going to be used and useful. You actually have to build it and see if people use it. Um, we did a survey where we looked at motivations for adoption and obstacles to adoption of smart grid by US utility companies. And the motivations we found, number one, was improved reliability. You see way out here over 80% of the companies mentioning them. And next was improved operational efficiency. And after that was reducing costs. So again, these are low risk investments. Um, they're very operational. We can improve our reliability and efficiency and lower our costs. Things like keeping up with industry peers or integrating renewables or distributed education, not that important. You know, they were in it for very tangible, predictable results. And in terms of obstacles, you see kind of the opposite that the biggest obstacle was technology immaturity. Um, the companies felt that this smart meter and smart grid technology hadn't been around long enough. There weren't widely accepted standards. Um, they didn't know if the next, you know, version two of the technology was going to make version one obsolete, which of course we know happens a lot in information technologies. Um, so, and some of them lacked in internal expertise to, to make it work. So uh, again, the obstacles tend to be just lack of money and the technology is not ready. Okay. So we interpreted that as pointing to the central role of risk. So in all of these cases, you see risk hiding. Um, in terms of technology, IT technology is generally riskier than non-IT. Um, you know, putting in software is more risky than putting in an upgraded transformer, um, which you know what it's going to do. Um, organizationally, Utilities tend to be risk averse. They've had that long culture of being a regulated monopoly and have not been a lot of uh, affection for, for risk. And the regulatory environment in the US is very slow to get any kind of investment improved. Um, it takes a long time. You have to go through literally a court process and get it approved by a public utility commission. Um, and as I'll show you next, the risk to utility is um, almost unlimited if they make a bad investment while the returns are limited. So I want to give an example of a utility called PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, which operates in Northern California. And PG&E was a leader in adopting smart mid-grid technologies. As you can see in a statement from the company, from 2017 to 2018, Pacific Gas and Electric continued to build capabilities to deliver on its vision of modernizing its grid. Innovative programs and plans detailed in this report helped PGE achieve the vision while also maintaining a safe and reliable grid. 
So they've been investing heavily for years to make the grid safe and reliable. And unfortunately, it hasn't all worked. So over 1,500 California fires were caused in the past six years, including the deadliest one ever in 2018 that killed about 80 people um, in a town called Pleasant in, um, I mean, Paradise. <laughs> Pleasant is what Donald Trump called it, actually. It's Paradise is a town in Northern California, which is almost totally wiped out. Um, in response, the next year, PG&E just cut off power to over a million customers and left them in the dark because they didn't want the power lines to spark and start the blazes. Um, and in the end, PG&E has filed for bankruptcy. and Its future is up in the air. So you can see how much risk there is, even if you've been in, in installed and deployed these technologies. So um, that's just a little story about smart grid research and uh, if you have any questions, I will answer them, but I want to tell you what we have that might be of interest and fun for you. If you're interested in this kind of thing at the iSchool, we have at the Smart Grid Research Center, where I'm the director, a lot of data that we're working with. So just to give you one example, we have data uh, from an organization called Pecan Street, Inc., which is in Austin, Texas. We have data on about 1,200 homes in four different states. We have data on electricity use and electricity generation at one minute intervals for about 15 to 20 appliances in each house for over seven years. And if you multiply that out, as I did in my calculator yesterday, it comes out to roughly 58 billion 867 million data points. So if you like big data and you want to play with big data, we've got some. <laughs> it may not be the kind of big data that Google has, but, you know, it'll keep you busy. You know, you, you, you'll learn something about wrangling a large amount of data, um, lining up the necessary computer power to analyze it and manage it and visualize it and so on. Um, just to give you an example of something we did, going back to what we were talking about before, we took the data from 90 homes in Austin. They all have solar. And we looked at average energy use and solar generation over one day in July of 2015. Okay? Now, the blue line is the sum of those 90 houses electricity usage. So you can see it starts at about 150 kilowatts at midnight, drops off a bit during the day and then starts going up and up until it hits about 300 kilowatts in the late afternoon. Um, the, the yellow line using our Syracuse colors here is the solar generation. So you can see there's none until about seven in the morning because it's dark, and then it starts to go up in a nice smooth curve and peaks out at about midnight, and then, I mean, noon, and then drops back down into the late afternoon. And if you look at the gray curve, this is what the grid needs to provide to these houses. Okay, this is where there's an excess of solar in the middle of the day, and the grid demand actually goes negative, and then the demand starts rising very rapidly in the late afternoon. So for extra credit, that gray scale, what would you call that? Anyone? What does it look like? The duck curve. Correct. You see the duck. It turns out the duck curve is all over the place. Any place where you have a lot of solar, you have a duck curve. So it's not just California. And it's a big problem to deal with that duck curve. So one of the things you have to do is to have data to be able to predict demand ahead of time. Um, you might notice here that this is July and the average high temperature in Austin is 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 Celsius. And 
when you have a hot day, this blue demand curve is being driven mostly by air conditioning. Different times of year, you get seasonal variation. So we're comparing January to July here. And you can see that the demand, the blue is much higher in July. It goes up to 300 kilowatt hours, whereas in January, it never goes much above 100. And as I note on the side, the average temperature in July is 95 degrees for high temperature. And in January, it's 46 degrees. So in January, there's no air conditioning, um, not much heating. Um, there's also not nearly as much solar. The peak is, is a little bit lower and it's a much shorter period of the day that you're getting solar. So as you go from season to season, this, this demand picture changes a lot. And utilities have to be able to respond to those changes and plan ahead to make sure that they can meet the load. Uh, and also there's year to year change. So this is both in October, but it's a year apart. You can see that just because it's October doesn't mean you know what the supply and demand are going to look like. Um, so you need all of this data to start to build up a picture and to be able to actually forecast what your needs are going to be. And all of that is made possible by the smart grid and by data analytics. Okay, so opportunities to work with our data. We've got this data, the Con Street data that I mentioned and some other data sets such as weather data that you can use. Um, there's text from utility interviews, privacy policies, and other documents. So if you're interested in text analysis, we have projects going on in that, um, along with more traditional data, data uh, analysis. And opportunities, we have students that work for the, the, the center, we usually have about two at any given time um, working on projects. And we've had about 15 over the years most of the work involves data management, administrative, um, analytics, and visualization. You can also use um, the data for projects outside the lab if they're student-led or faculty-led. Um, so if you have your own project idea or you're working with a faculty that has an idea, you can make use of that data. There are some restrictions in how it can be used in the Pecan Street license, but we can work that out. Um, some data can also be made available for classroom. So all of this is a, a, available to you, and I hope you'll make use of it. If you're interested, you can contact me. Uh, it's my email, and there's our, our Smart Grid Research Center, which sits in 205 Heinz Hall. Uh, and we have a website with more information on our research projects and so on. So I think I used up all my time, unfortunately, but if you want to hang out a couple minutes, does anyone have um, questions? I'm happy to stay on a little bit and answer other questions. Sir, uh, this uh, is Davya here. Uh, I had a question. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, uh, we talk a lot about industrial IoT and, uh, you know, predictive maintenance in nuclear power plants, uh, power plants in all these places. Mm -hmm. But uh, recently, uh, during COVID uh, situation, there was a, a blast in a power, thermal power, points, uh, power station in mm -hmm. India. Uh, how could a smart grid have prevented this? Because it happened uh, basically due to negligence. Do you, know what the do, you, do, you, do you know what the cause was of the explosion? Uh, so basically, uh, they were they were supposed to be some kind of, uh, you know, maintenance. Uh, people were supposed to go and check, but due to COVID, they couldn't, uh, you know, visit the power plant. And... Uh, Mere negligence and all these things, a temperature rose and uh, there was a blast in the boiler. Yeah, so I mean, the Internet of Things would con consist of a lot of different monitors or sensors. So ideally, you would have sensors on the equipment and that they would pick up a change in temperature or a change in pressure um, that might not be obvious from the outside. But if they're measuring temperature and pressure and, and um, vibration or whatever it might be, they may pick up small fluctuations and give you some warning that there might be a problem there. And when that IoT data comes back 
usually to the data center or to the cloud or wherever it's analyzed, there's data analytic tools and software that can take that information into, a, into their algorithms and say, ah, if I see pressure rising here and I see power quality dropping over there and I see temperature rising there, I put those three things together in my algorithm and it says, uh, uh oh, there's likely going to be a problem with that transformer or that piece of the grid and bypass that, you know, shut down and bypass that piece of the grid before you get the explosion. Okay, that's, that's kind of a, in a nutshell what, what the IoT and the associated software that goes with the IoT and the data analytics can do. Professor Dedrick, I've got a question from the chat, and then I think we have another from Trishla as her hand raised um, mm -hmm. from the chat is from Brendan. Um, it's an interesting one. Uh, he's an incoming uh, library student, master's in library and information science student. Um, this mm -hmm. is uh, how can libraries or librarians as a profession, how can they kind of support and get involved in this smart grid research? Um, so the parts of this, so, I mean, you, you may be interested in the smart grid per se, um, in terms of how libraries are powered and, and whether the libraries are moving towards green energy. You know, there's a lot of buildings, library buildings, certainly around the country, you would have a large number of buildings. And so they would have the same issues with energy of, you know, carbon footprint, uh, reliability and the things that we, we talked about before, um, in which case these same kinds of applications, smart grid applications, sensing, data analytics, um, can make those buildings more efficient and more reliable uh, and reduce the carbon footprint. And also kind of from the perspective of you coming in as an MLIS student, um, our our data sets and our labs are available to students. They're not just available to uh, IM students or whatever. That's why you know, we, we invited everybody to this, to this talk today because anyone can come in and get some experience, some hands-on experience with a really big data, big data set. Um, and what you learn, I think, with that data, you know, you could transpose that and say, okay, if I were in charge of facilities and energy management for a library or library system or campus, how would I use those tools? What could they do for me? And you know, you could build a project where you actually have real, real time um, data, maybe from some of the buildings um, to do that. Does that help? Does that answer? Excellent. Yes, thank you. Now we've got hands raised. And I think we'll wrap up. Uh, uh, we'll Trishla's question next, and then Abhijit. Uh, so Trishla, go ahead. I think you can unmute yourself. Professor, I wanted to know how would the grid protect itself from hackers and crackers? Since it's connected to the internet and using IoT device, it's quite susceptible to uh, hacks. So how would it protect itself? The sound was a little bit bad, Trish. Are we talking about hacks into the system? Yeah, I believe Professor Correct. Shea, how, how can the grid kind of protect itself from, from hacks? So I'll say one thing. The grid has already been infiltrated. There's a lot of evidence that foreign and international people have already sort of pre-positioned different kinds of malware on the grid. The grid has been attacked in certain times. The grid in, the, in, in Ukraine was attacked allegedly by Russian agents who took down a, a large part of the grid for 24 hours or something like that. Our grid is vulnerable. Um, the way to minimize the threat is all of the good housekeeping, cybersecurity practices that you would use anywhere else. But you have to remember that you're not just protecting your, your data center or your centralized resources. You can't put a firewall around the whole grid. It's all over the place. So you have to have other ways of, of protecting it in the field. Um, and it can be anything from encryption to um, 
roles that people are allowed to play and um, encryption of data at rest and encryption of data in motion. Um, physical barriers are really important. There was someone in San Jose, California a few years ago with a gun shooting at a big transformer. And at the time people started saying, you know, if you took out 27 major transformers in the US electric grid, you would bring down the entire grid for the whole United States. And so here was somebody shooting at these things and it probably didn't damage them because it didn't have a high powered enough rifle, but physical security of all of the facilities is critical and all of the other cybersecurity tools that you do. We actually have a project where we're looking at the impacts of these um, distributed grids where everyone has a smart meter and there's internet of things all over the grid and how someone could come in and for instance take over my smart meter and the transmissions that I'm sending back to spoof and the grid operator thinks it's me, but it's really someone that's taken over my account and sending bad information. And if someone were doing that with a few thousand customers, they could do a lot of damage. You know, put in a signal that I want more power and then not use it. Or um, if you had solar, put in the signal that I have a lot of power to sell and then not have it available. This kind of, there's kind of endless, um, possibilities for mischief and hacking on the grid. And it's a huge responsibility of the, uh, the grid operators and everyone they work with to protect that because the, 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 the results could be really devastating. And Professor Dedrick, we do have a couple more hands up. Do you, do you have mm -hmm. a few spare minutes to, to answer? Sure. Okay, sure. Uh, Abhijit, how about you go ahead? Uh, hello, Professor uh, Abhijit here. Hello, Abhijit. Uh, uh, I have a question regarding uh, like uh, when you show when you showed us that uh, diagram block diagram of how uh, energy get uh, we get energy from solar panels, from wind turbines as well as from um, energy production plants. Mm -hmm. So like how about having that hybrid uh, mechanism uh, at the larger scale as well as at the uh, like in person scale like at like if I am, if I have a house and I have this kind of technology mechanism with me, then in uh, in the times like having the uh, natural calamities or any kind of uh, uh, problematic situation, then instead of just uh, like depending on one kind of uh, renewable energy resources, uh, we can have like uh, uh, kind of have the natural resources as well, but we'll use it whenever there is a need only. So need based uh, kind of system. So in that way, can if we like implement hybrid uh, energy mechanism at uh, each and every house, then mm -hmm. uh, will it like um, uh, like uh, minimize the uh, uh, energy production kind of uh, issues that you just mentioned a couple of slides ago? Yeah. So um, distribution of energy and uh, kind of uh, that path. Yeah, so there's a couple elements of that. So just having backup power, you can buy your own diesel generator for the, if the power goes out. Um, big critical infrastructure systems like hospitals and fire stations often have backup power supplies. Um, what's coming online now is more like what I think you're calling a hybrid, which is a combination of solar plus battery. Um, so if I have solar panels that can charge a battery, then when the sun comes down, or if the power goes out, I have my battery. And even if the power goes out on the grid, I can separate from the grid and use my own solar. Um, that can be done by one house or one facility, but can also be done by a larger group of buildings or even an entire university campus. And it's called a microgrid. And in that case, the whole university or maybe it's a whole hospital complex can go off the grid and have its own solar and have its own backup power and can sustain itself sometimes for days or weeks um, without having any power from the grid. Uh, so 
in New York State alone, there are dozens of microgrid projects going on. Uh, and a lot of them are in places like Long Island that I showed you in that first superstorm, Sandy, were hit the hardest. They went weeks without power. And so they're building microgrids so that if the main power lines go down for weeks, they'll still have their own power. They'll have their solar and their, their batteries. Maybe they'll have some diesel backup or whatever it is. And they, they'll be able to keep on functioning as individuals or as um, institutions. I think we'll uh, Abu, thank you, final question from Abu. Good morning, Professor DJ. Uh, my name is Abu. Um, a couple hot take questions. Uh, my first is, um, is it smart to create a smart grid in um, cities that are prone to natural disasters? And my second is, how can students get involved in, like, what are some best approaches to um, relaying information to local legis legislators to implement smart, uh, smart city technologies? Um, yeah, so, so first question I say, yeah, that's, you want the smart grid in cities that are vulnerable, probably more than in other cities. They may take a different form or have different emphasis. So, um, focusing on outage recovery, having a very robust outage recovery system because, you know, a hurricane comes along and takes down power lines, there's going to be outages. And the faster you can get them repaired, the better. So that might be your focus um, in a vulnerable area. Um, you may also want to, this isn't so much smart, it's kind of a physical brute force approach, but putting power lines underground so you don't have these poles with power lines that get blown down and get flooded. Um, it's what they call hardening the grid. And so it's putting the grid underground so it's not as vulnerable to um, these disasters. Um, and also the, the, these are places where microgrids make sense. So that if a power line goes down in one part of the city or there's an outage in one power of the city, other parts of the city can go on, on their microgrid and still have power. Um, so, yeah, so in these vulnerable places, I think we saw with Houston, um, which is always vulnerable to hurricanes, they happen all the time in that area. So the investments they made really paid off um, when they got hit by that huge storm. So, so yeah, it's, it is really important um, in vulnerable areas and smart grid would probably take certain forms also in, in those vulnerable areas that would make sense. Uh, and your second question was getting in touch with um, political leaders or, or um, politicians in terms of encouraging them to, to adopt smart grid, right? Um, so there are certain people who have influence over these decisions. So one group is the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, in New York State, that's actually called the Public Service Commission. And they make a lot of decisions about what gets done and what gets approved and what doesn't get approved. So you can reach out to them. There's ways to, uh, if there's a case coming up, that you can ask to be heard on that case. You know, that you can, They'll give a time of comment and you can write a letter and have your voice heard in that, in that process. And they do respond. I mean, they might respond to one letter, but if they're getting a number of letters from people that are, or emails or whatever that are concerned about this issue, um, that can have an impact. Um, the other group that's important is the legislature. So the Public Utility Commission is making decisions, but they're also making you're also implementing decisions that the legislature makes. So the New York legislature, the New York state legislature created something called reforming the energy vision. It came after that hurricane Sandy. They realized, hey, we've got a big problem here. We really have to do something differently. So they've been building out a new kind of grid 
And you know, I won't go into all the details of it. You can, you can look it up if you're interested, but a grid that's more decentralized and more distributed and more reliable and more resilient and also able to handle higher levels of solar and wind power without getting too much of that duck curve. So um, the legislature itself, which makes policy and has money to spend and the Public Utilities Commission, which makes decisions on specific projects and specific proposals are probably the places where um, you can have the most impact. Does that make sense? Is that what you were, you were asking about, Abu? Yeah, that was brilliant and I have a place to start. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. I do think we have to wrap up there. So I want to thank uh, Professor Dedrick for his time, for his presentation today and his willingness to, to answer our questions. Um, I also want to thank everyone else for, for joining us and, and asking those questions. So uh, again, thank you all for your time and thank you, Professor Dedrick. Uh, please keep a lookout for our future kind of iterations of our iSchool Insights um, sessions. Um, if you didn't get to ask a question today or if you have uh, other questions related to the iSchool, I'm putting my email address in the chat box, um, though I'm sure many of you have received emails from me before. Uh, please feel free to, to send me an email with those questions. Um, if I can answer them myself, I will. If not, I will uh, make sure I get them to you. So, um, yeah. yeah, and here's my email information. If you're interested in, uh, since I won't be physically on the lab for a little while, um, you, can, you can contact us. If you're interested in working on a project or just talking about what we're doing, you know, always happy to involve students. So, um, if any of this has interested you or you have questions or are interested in the lab, just you know, shoot me an email and, and we'll have a talk. We'll, we'll get on Zoom and, and can have a little more discussion. Thank you. Thank you again, Professor Dedrick, and, and thank you all for joining us. So, we'll, we'll speak to you soon. All right, my pleasure.